Good morning. And welcome as we gather in worship uh, here at Riverside in the building, as well as those who are watching on Zoom and YouTube now or later. We uh, offer this experience of worship in the hope that it will uh, nourish our faith and that we, in the midst of it, can care for one another. As we gather today, we acknowledge that we gather on the unceded territory of the Algonquin, and we seek to live uh, in friendship and peace and reconciliation. And as we gather, we light our candles. We light our Christ candle, which is found in the circle of friends, the circle of community. And as a circle of community, we gather to seek that light and to know the empowerment of being disciples and followers of Jesus. And we light our rainbow candle, reminding us of our commitment to be a community that understands that that love of God is known <laughs> and cherished for all people. We join together in our invitation to worship and invite uh, the many voices to read the bolder uh, indented print. We are called to gather together to be the church. We are invited to live deeper into the spiritual beings that we are. May this be a time of worship that inspires us to be and to become a community of Jesus' disciples. Him, come and find the quiet center.
amidst the chaos and the clutter, amidst our longings and our needs. May your spirit reach our souls, loving God. May we dare how we are part of and hope. Inspired by Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I'm going to have a conversation up here at the front. So if anybody wants to join me. <laughs> now we'll see if this microphone keeps working today. We're still testing things. So how are you, Isabel? Good? Well, I don't know if you've ever met this guy. Okay? This is my long neglected puppet who uh, sits on my shelf in my office and only makes an appearance on certain days. And today is one of those days. And the reason he's making an appearance today is because of his name. Any guesses what his name might be? Nova Scotia. No, nope, that's just his t-shirt. <laughs> he didn't come with that. <clears throat> I added that. And I also put a mask on him today. So it's kind of hard to talk today, isn't it, Micah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I just said it. Did you hear it? Micah. Micah is his name. That's right. And so when I got this puppet, he might be 30 years old or more. I chose the name Micah because I really like the guy in the Bible whose name is Micah. And Micah was a prophet. You know what a prophet is? Okay. It's not what you get if you get, make more money than you spend. That's, that was your guess? No, okay. It's spelt differently. It's P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Okay. And there was a time, see, because in the story of God's people, with the Hebrew people, all kinds of different leaders were tried. Okay, there was, they tried people like Moses, and then they went to judges, and then they went to kings, and then they kind of went to prophets. And prophets were ones who spoke truth. We sometimes think of that prophet as predicting the future, but in that time it was more, they kind of spoke the truth to, and, and, and in challenging times, okay? So Micah was a prophet, and we're going to sing in a minute his most favorite, his most famous line and, and call, and so that's why I named him, is because I liked, liked what the prophet Micah in the Bible said. Okay? And he just happens to like Nova Scotia. So, and he's even wearing a mask today. It's kind of hard to talk with a mask on, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're pretty quiet today. Yeah. Okay. I've gotten less bold about having him talk and, you know, all that stuff. So, okay. So we're going to try um, the, the song. We're going to sing the song, What Does the Lord Require of Us? And we have a video that teaches it. And this, on the video are Jim and Jean Strafty. And they have written a number of hymns that we sing. And this isn't the first time that Jim and Jean Strafty have been in this sanctuary. Because in 2007, they were here to do a concert. So they're not here in person today, but they're here on video. So... There's three lines, we've sung this before, and we sometimes sing it in a round, but the way they teach it is you can either sing all three lines in order, or you can pick one and keep with it, depending on, the, on your voice, okay? So, they're going to teach it to us. We just need to click on it, and then click again, and then we'll sing this together. And Mary and, uh, Mary and Wendy and Wayne are going to help as well. What does the Lord require of you? This is a setting of Micah 6.8 from the Hebrew Scriptures. It's a song designed for three parts, so we're going to divide the room into three sections, uh, section 1, section 2, and section 3. Now sometimes people like to sing, who have low voices, like to sing the first part, and uh, people with middle voices would sing the second, and people with higher voices, along with children, can sing the third. We're going to do each part two times, and then we'll start at the beginning, adding each voice in. And it will be beautiful if you sing out boldly. So here we go. What 
What does the Lord require of you? 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 And you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, uh, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth to me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. And uh, chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? 
Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? May the spirit of life move through the speaking and hearing of our sacred story. May we find ourselves in the story. Amen. Let us pray. God of life, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our minds and hearts lead us to deeper understanding of you and the love you call us to live. Amen. Deep spirituality, daring justice, bold discipleship. Six intriguing words. Which of these words attracts your attention, piques your curiosity, echoes your longing? Daring, bold, deep, spirituality, justice, discipleship. Well, these six words, these three two-word statements are recently discerned calls for the United Church of Canada. Over the past few years, the National Church has engaged in a process of focus as various realities have led to a need to be clear about vision, purpose, and mission. Last Saturday at the meeting of the Eastern Ontario Udaway Regional Council, which is the wider church level that we are part of as a congregation, we spent some time exploring the call and vision articulated for the United Church of Canada. The vision statement reads, called by God as disciples of Jesus, the United Church of Canada seeks to be bold, connected, evolving church of diverse, courageous, hope-filled communities, united in deep spirituality, inspiring worship, and daring justice. Well, we are one of those somewhere between two and 3,000 communities of faith in this United Church of ours. And so we are invited to ponder this visioning work and to see how it connects with our sense of identity and purpose. A few years ago, we had our own discernment process and determined our vision and mission statements. And that process has helped us to focus our priorities of ministry. We didn't imagine COVID when we were going through that process. And so some ideas have not had the chance to develop. And yet those statements helped our focus as we had to find unimagined ways of nourishing our faith, caring for one another and building partnerships in the neighborhood and beyond. These discernment and refocusing processes are important in changing times as the people of God struggle to determine what it means to be the people of God. What does God require of us in our time and place? How does holy truth get lived out in a time when other values and instincts and priorities seem to have louder voice? Well, <clears throat> this is not the first time that holy truth has found itself pushed aside. Today we have heard the words from the prophet Micah, we have been away from our journey through the Hebrew scripture narrative for a couple of weeks, but we are back on track and find ourselves near the end of the 8th century before the common era. Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms of the Hebrew story, are under siege from the Assyrian Empire. It was a challenge to keep the covenants of the tradition amidst changing realities. 
And so the narrative moves into a time when the primary model of leadership for the Hebrew people is prophets. Prophets are messengers of God's word. In our time, we tend to use the word prophet as a predictor of the future. But in the biblical understanding, a prophet was one who interpreted the present. The prophets held up God's vision and truth to show how the actions of the people are not following the covenant. So we have today two short passages from Micah, probably the most significant verses from his writing, verses that kind of transcend time and context. The first is about the small town of Bethlehem. Micah is from a rural area, and he is pointing out that leadership can emerge from the lowly and the least, as they, there was a bias toward the big city. Of course, this passage becomes significant in the shaping of the birth story of Jesus. It's not that Micah was predicting the event, but it was part of the messianic promise narrative that got picked up. The second passage from Micah, the words from chapter 6, are the most famous words of this prophet and one of the most well-known passages of the Old Testament. It's so well known because the question of the passage transcends time and context. What does the Lord require of us? And Micah uses that question to denounce the understanding that sacrifices are enough. He uses some hyperbole of 10,000 rivers of oil to bring attention to how off track this sacrifice idea has become in the religious context of the time. The sacrifice of the firstborn may not have been exaggerated because there's some evidence that the Assyrian kings were believing that standard. So with the question, Micah does a revisioning process for the people and says, O mortal, you know what is right. Remember the laws and the covenant? What does the Lord require but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Now, the concepts of justice and kindness, or often also interpreted as mercy, are consistent words and teaching in the Hebrew narrative, mishpah and hesed. The word that is translated as humbly is unique. And it's the only time that it is used in the Old Testament. Translation of words is tricky. And while humbly is the most common translation, other English words that help to expand the Hebrew meaning are intentionally, deliberately, walk humbly, deliberately, intentionally with your God. So what does it mean to do justice, to live love as a verb, and to walk intentionally with our God in this time and place, in this culture and world? Well, that's a question we may many ponder individually, but also collectively as a church and as the body of Christ. And we certainly know that there are various understandings of faithfulness in our time, And so the body of Christ is broken into various denominations and theological perspectives. Other paths and religious traditions also have their own emphasis and priorities. God's truth and love is greater than our understanding, and so there is a diversity of focus. We also live in a world that increasingly identifies as non-religious. We live in a world where much leadership is driven by ambition and power that is, more, that is more narrowly focused than on the kingdom of God. And in the pursuit of power and greed, there is often sacrifice of human dignity, well-being, and even life along the way. 
So let's come back to those words, deep spirituality, daring justice, bold discipleship. Which one attracts your attention, sparks your curiosity, echoes your longing? I find these words intriguing because we live in a time that could be described as shallow, timid, reluctant. As citizens in our culture, there's lots of despair and apathy. There is weariness and fear as COVID extends longer than we imagined or hoped for. There is anxiety as the world lives with econ economically unsettled and unpredictable times and uncertain and worried about situations like the Ukraine. We begin to see the effects of how the climate is changing and it's hard to face. What does that mean for how we need to live? As part of the church, we know reality is changing but we feel unequipped to be the church because patterns of spirituality and faithfulness are changing. In a society of individualism, how do we offer community in engaging ways? I think the phrase that most intrigues me is bold discipleship. Because what does that require of me? Of us. Discipleship is a commitment to follow the way of Jesus, and I've been trying to do that most of my life. And for most of my life, I have known a lot of other people trying to live in similar values and practices. But in an ever-changing context, what does that mean moving forward? As an introvert, I think I'm a little scared about the word bold. What does bold look like? There was a long pause here while I was writing the sermon. And then I began to think. Maybe being bold is more about ideas and values rather than style or personality. Maybe being bold is risking new ways of imagining being church and in building partnerships. Maybe being bold is being clear that all people are created in the image of God. And so all the labels and social constructs that we have created to distinguish and divide are not as important as the fundamental truth of each of us being a human being. Maybe being bold is facing the truth of our history in this nation and working for reconciliation and healing amongst the settler and indigenous people. Maybe being bold is cherishing the reality that my spirituality deepens when I work at connections amongst people and communities and ideas. Maybe being bold is walking intentionally with a God who is energy of love and hope in a culture that seems to dwell in despair. What does the Lord require of you, of us? Well, that's one of the eternal questions of faithfulness that we wrestle with. And there are various messengers, various realities, various processes of discernment that help us to focus our response. May it continue to be so. I thought I had finished the sermon with that last sentence. But yesterday, right after I typed that last sentence, I looked at Facebook 
and in my feed was a meme that reads, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Amen. ways that we offer that is for the life and work of this community of faith through us, some of our partners in the community around the world. And so a symbol of all of us, we present our own. And as we do so, we can expect doxology. So that your work of love and peace may be known in our midst, in our community, and in the So we move to our prayers of the people, and one of the things that I mentioned in the sermon was that we are part of the Eastern Ontario, Eastern Ontario Udaway Regional Council. That somebody in that region had cycle, uh, inviting uh, community, individuals, 
to remember various um, congregations and communities in prayer. And today, the named community of faith. And so we don't know how many people praying for us today, but we can at least pray for ourselves. But as we also get Somebody want to run this around? Okay. Uh, we'd like you to keep Molly in your thoughts and prayers. She's uh, in hospital in Elizabeth Bruyere with her broken hip. But uh, things are going well, and she'll be um, hopefully out at the end of this coming week. But uh, you never know with things like that. But uh, thanks for... Good doctors and caring <laughs> nurses and uh, good hospitals. Other good news is that back in June. Uh, my son and his partner received a phone call from Toronto and the coaches. And would they accept a young woman and her daughter, age 21, and a cat, a dog, <laughs> who have traveled by, by themselves from Ukraine seeking accommodation? And I am very happy to tell you that just in the last 10 days, this young couple, a mother and daughter, Eric's father, was killed by one of Putin's bombs. By one of Putin's bombs, an incendiary one, and the, and the father was was killed in the home when the when the other two were helping someone else. But I wish to say that they are launched. They now, in the last ten days, have an apartment of their own, and both of them have jobs. So is it, talk about accepting a challenge, you know, within somebody phoning you, or two complete strangers, will you take them into your home? So I am very proud of a young man, excuse me, who grew up in this church, who found the challenge of two strangers, and has seen this forward. I will, uh... Sad news, of, uh, I received the death of Bill Griffin. Um, Bill had been in hospital a few weeks and took a turn uh, in the last little while, and so um, he died early in the morning. I was talking to Betty a little over an hour ago and Roxanne, and uh, they're still sorting out what all, you know, so no, no information on what's happened beyond this is, is available at this point, but we hold Betty and Roxanne and in our prayers. Let us join together in prayer. So loving God, we gather in your presence. We gather together in your presence to help us to focus what it means to be your people, what it means to follow Jesus, And so we give thanks for the wisdom, the examples, the memories, the inspirations that give us that background and that strength and that empowerment and those values to live into the world. We give thanks for this community of faith and for the many persons who have come through these doors and glimpsed a sense of what it means to live in, in love and in hope. Gracious God, we... Remember 
persons who are hurting. We remember those who are in the hospital recovering from surgery. We remember those who are grieving. We remember those who are searching. And we pray that your strength and your peace will be known. We pray for our world, particularly for Ukraine, and all those living in the bound of that nation, but also others led to many parts of the world. We pray for world leaders as they gather days, may truth and wisdom be known boldly. Pray, O oh God, for each of us that we to find the strength amidst varying realities and anxieties and stresses to be faithful. Faithful as we all the way reveal to us Jesus. And together, remember the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So again, a word of welcome to those that are worshiping with us today. And uh, there are a few uh, announcements, uh, most of which are on the screen or in the bulletin, but a few to uh, mention, to highlight. I don't know if anybody noticed uh, when they drove in this morning into the parking lot uh, that you may have missed. Did you miss the potholes that were once there? <laughs> the, uh, we had some paving patching done uh, late this week, and thankfully, because of the length and season, we were able to get it in before winter. So there, the pa parking lot is hopefully smoother uh, for now. <laughs> Uh, we are looking for persons to do various tasks that help Sunday morning to happen, um, such as scripture reading, such as setting up the front, offering those type of things. Um, the ministry team uh, leads, which is kind of our programming group, uh, had a meeting this week and discussed a bunch of things. But one of the things that we thought we would do is keep uh, doing worship the way we're kind of doing it now in terms of certainly hybrid, but also not instituting, reinstituting coffee hour yet. Uh, but we'll keep with that. So that's one big thing that's not on the list to sign up for yet. Uh, but we encourage folks to visit, as you have been, uh, in, the, in the sanctuary before you, uh, before you leave to go home. I did notice as I was came in this morning that there's still several uh, small plants, uh, spider plants and aloe vera plants that were part of the bazaar and are still there. So if anybody would like one, I think we were asking $2 for them. So if you would like to take a plant home, that would be great. And we had a visitor this week. Riley Brockington, our city councillor, um, came and presented this framed uh, certificate, so I'll just read it to you. On behalf of members of Ottawa City Council, 
It is our distinct pleasure to extend congratulations to members of the Congregation of Riverside United Church in recognition of the celebration of its 60th anniversary serving the community. Since 1962, Riverside United Church has not only been a place of worship for Ottawa residents, but also a vibrant community of people who are committed to their family, friends, and neighbors who enrich the life of our great city, including through many activities which support our citizens during their times of need. We want to offer our best wishes to the clergy and congregation of Riverside United Church for continued success with their mission. And it's signed by Mayor Jim Watson, might have been one of the last signatures, and by Riley, uh, by Brockington. So we'll find a place to hang this up, but uh, it was good to see and it was good to show Riley our renovations because he certainly is, uh, his his work uses this space quite frequently for community meetings and was pleased with the added capacities that it'll now have for such things. Any other announcements? Oh, Mary's got something. If you're looking for something to do on Friday night, I've got a suggestion. This Friday, November 18th, at Emmanuel United Church on uh, Smythe Road, they're having, they're hosting a kitchen party, a Down East style kitchen party. If you've ever been to one of those, you'll know it's great fun. It is being, uh, the music is by the Lion Street Celtic Band and all the proceeds are going to the food banks, the Ottawa food banks, of which Heron Emergency Food Centre is one of them. So if you would like to go to this, I'm sure it will be a great evening. The, the admission is by donation and it's at 7.30 at uh, Emmanuel United Church, 691 Smythe Road, and I'm sure it'll be a great evening. Thank you. Our uh, closing hymn is Faith of Our Fathers. Oh, and after, um, after the Choral Amen, after the benediction, uh, one of the things that I've noticed since I, we've been in hybrid worship is that I haven't had really any connection with those people who are on Zoom. And so after the benediction, I'm going to go into the office and interact with those folks for a few minutes while the postlude is on, and then I'll get, eventually get back out to the door to greet some of you folks. So.
in the present, we are invited to be true to those teachings, to those values, so that love and hope is known in our world. So we go boldly. We go faithfully, knowing that we go not alone. But God, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer goes with us this day, each day, and forevermore.